Hello everyone. In the last class, we had discussed about the uh, different types of spectra that we normally obtain in uh, spectroscopy. Those included line spectra, band spectra and continuous spectra we have been uh, discussing. So, line spectra are nothing but a series of well defined peaks and band spectrum consists of several groups of frequency closely spaced, but not well resolved peaks. The continuum spectrum of course, as usual you can understand that there are no specific peaks to be identified in the region. So, normally line spectra and band spectra are superimposed in the continuum spectra. Okay. And then we have discussed how the line spectra occur, what are the typical weights of the peaks and uh, other things like uh, approximate peak width would be approximately about 10 raise to minus 5 nanometers. And we have specifically stated that X-ray line spectra are produced by transitions of electrons and uh, to the innermost orbitals. And uh, band spectra are essentially vibrational energy levels occurring around 10 raise to minus 15 seconds etcetera. Therefore, the transition occurs from the lowest transitional vibrational energy level of the excited state to any of the vibrational energy level of the ground state. These are the typical transitions. And then we have discussed about the continuum spectra, the energy peaks shift to shorter wavelengths with increasing temperature, heated solids are more important sources of UV, visible, infrared and all those things we have discussed. Now, I want to continue our discussion with the absorption of radiation. So, absorption of radiation normally occurs in the uh, using electromagnetic uh, energy by the atoms, ions and molecules that promote them to higher energy excited states according to the laws of quantum mechanics. There is no escaping quantum mechanics laws any it anywhere in physics or spectroscopy. The energy difference corresponding to each excitation is unique for each species thus permitting the characterization of the sample. This is usually accomplished normally by plotting the absorbance as a function of wavelength or frequency. Look at this slide now. This is what uh, exactly I have been trying to tell you. So, the absorption spectra differ widely in appearance from sharp peaks to small smooth continuous curves depending upon the physical state, complexity of the molecules and the environment of the sample which we call it as matrix. Sometimes the matrix uh, may be a very simple pure compound. Sometimes I want to find out what is a specific compound in a given sample, then the remaining all the other part components of the sample is known as matrix except the analyte. So, uh, the matrix may be in the form of a liquid or solid or it may be in the gaseous form, but quite often it may not be possible to take the spectra directly as it is we will have to do some pre concentration or pre treatment and then uh, we can we should be able to take the spectra. Because uh, quite often the requirements of a sample uh, to be inserted in a spectrograph or spectrometer or spectrophotometer anything. So, they are very specific. For example, if you want to do the UV visible spectrum, you need to take the sample in a cuvette about uh, 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter, 5 centimeter, 10 centimeter like that. And then if you want atomic absorption, then you will have to aspirate the sample. For that, the sample must be in the dissolved form, otherwise it is not possible. Like that, there are different ways of preparing the sample for spectroscopic analysis. So, the quality of the spectrum also changes depending upon the 
suitability of the sample for the particular kind of spectroscopic analysis. So, atomic spectra of an element results in only a few simple and uh, as excitation can occur only at electronic energy levels, the outermost uh, or bonding electrons are involved. So, molecular absorption spectra are usually more complex because they involve quantized electronic, vibrational and rotational energy levels. So, the energy of the vibrational transition is much more than that of rotational transitions and energy of the electronic uh, vibration electronic transition is much more than the vibrational energy levels. So, that, uh, that said we will take a look at the molecular absorption peaks that involve electronic energy. What we have said earlier they electro they are fairly broad owing to the presence of number of vibrational and rotational energy levels associated with them. As a result the spectrum of a compound consists of number of closely spaced absorption lines that constitute a broad smooth absorption band giving the impression of a continuous spectrum. So, absorption of pure vibrational energy is the basis of infrared spectroscopy that is what we are going to study uh, in this course now, but the pure rotational absorption spectra are also observed in the microwave region. This is also sort of uh, um, uh, useful for inorganic compounds characterization of inorganic compounds, we do need rotational absorption spectra. So, electronic uh, spectral transitions in ions and molecules gives rise to spectrophotometry, wavelength of the energy source does not change here, okay. only the change in the intensity of the incident beam and transmitted beam. Those two are the things which are measured. So, we are going to plot the difference between the transmitted energy and the incident energy. So, versus wavelength. So, uh, I will get a small peak corresponding to the electronic transitions, but every electronic transition is also associated with vibrational and rotational. So, I get a broad peak in UV visible spectrometry. Sometimes the absorbed energy of the molecule is re emitted as a radiation of lower frequency and uh, or lower wavelength this results in fluorescence phenomena. This also I have taught earlier in my spectrophotometry course. The, sometimes energy changes occurring in the electrons and nuclei under a strong magnetic field are best studied by NMR that is nuclear magnetic resonance or electron spin resonance also are the suitable spectroscopic techniques for studying the changes occurring in the electrons and nuclei. So, uh, now I will spend a little time on the spectrophotometry U visible even though I had taught it earlier let us just have a quick look. So, to absorb radiation a molecule must interact with the radiation within a time frame of about 10 raise to minus 15 seconds. So, exchange of energy occurs only by the interaction of the potential energy component of the molecules via movement of the electrons. These can be interpreted as a vertical line in the energy diagram. This is how we draw the spectrum. So, absorption bands occur only at specific uh, wavelength values corresponding to the energies required to promote the electrons from one level to another. So, absorption terminates when the solute molecule in the excited state loses its energy. See an excited electronic state cannot last forever, after some time the electrons will revert back to the ground state. So, at that point the molecule must return to the ground state by means of radiation less processes. If it is accompanied by radiation then it will be of low, longer wavelength or lower energy than the incident radiation, but it could be called as fluorescence. 
but if there is no emission of radiation then we have absorption. So, only the absorption process is a radiation less process that means the incident radiation after absorption would have lost its energy to the molecule and that energy cannot be recovered or something like that it is already lost. How it is lost? It is lost to the uh, by maybe by increasing the temperature of the sample or it may be lost by transferring energy to the other molecules in the spectrum or the matrix like that there are several mechanisms we will also discuss uh, some of them and uh, sometimes quite often the other molecules uh, will collide with the excited molecules all those things are possible. So, the excess energy is normally partitioned to other vibrational and rotational energy levels also. So, both these relaxation these are called as relaxation processes. So, what is a relaxation process? A relaxation process is one in which the excited uh, the energy absorbed is lost into the matrix without appearing as electromagnetic radiation again that is without appearing as fluorescence. So, the relaxation processes are accomplished by the loss of thermal energy only. So, to explain all this we have the molecular orbital theory. So, when two atoms react to form a compound electrons from both atoms participate that we have seen earlier and uh, in the formation of the bond and they occupy a new energy level that is known as molecular orbital where bonding electrons are associated with the molecule as a whole this we know. So, this is called as bonding orbital and other is um, non bonding orbital which is not populated at the lower level uh, ground level or room temperature. So, the bonding or occupancy of the electrons in the bonding orbital represents a lowest energy level that is what I have written in this slide. So, uh, the my first slide regarding the molecular orbital theory simply says that the electrons are there and uh, they are in the bonding orbital. Now, simultaneously a corresponding anti bonding orbital is also formed in space okay, or its energy is higher than that than the bonding energy, but it is not a state which is visible to you. For example, bonding and uh, even bonding energy level bonds are not visible to you in a day to day life you will see only a compound but we can visualize the structure of a bonded uh, of a compound with the bonding sigma bonding pi bonding etcetera. And these have been taught to you at the high school level even college level etcetera. So, there are um, ionic bonds covalent bonds coordinate bonds and several types of bonds are available they form and these may be formed by the combination of s and p orbitals sometimes d orbitals also and these are designated as sigma and pi bonds respectively. So, corresponding anti bonding orbitals are sigma star and pi star this we have discussed earlier a little bit, but this is just to refresh um, your memory. So, valence electrons not participating in chemical bonding are referred to as non bonding or n electrons. So, in organic molecules n electrons are located in the atomic orbitals of nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur and halogen. So, this is how the molecular orbital elect, uh, electronic orbital energies are represented. Here I am seeing I am showing you the pi bonds ok the, the intersections represent two carbon atoms and there is a pi bond and these pi orbitals p orbitals are dumbbell shaped, but they are not rigid bonds. So, there is certain amount of overlapping of each other. So, in effect the before bonding, um, but you can imagine that these are uh, 
this could be in the same axis or perpendicular axis also. So, if they are in the same axis it will look something like this one above and one below something like half moon and uh, so this also is possible the one which I am showing you at the bottom is uh, again this is plus this is minus. So, that means they are in one above the plane one below the plane and uh, atom A and atom B are there. So, the molecule A B may be forming like this. So, in this case the pi bonds are oriented perpendicular to each other. This is what happens when the anti bonding orbitals are present. So, if the electrons are occupying anti bonding orbitals I have a shape something like this which I am showing you at the bottom and on the top it is bonding orbital that means interactions of 2 p orbitals in bonding state is like this anti bonding state would be like this. So, having understood that now let us uh, uh, move on to the infrared spectroscopy because now I feel that you have most of the requisite information regarding the to learn the spectroscopy of infrared. Uh, so, uh, now we will move on to that and uh, um, before that I want you to appreciate that the infrared spectroscopy is only part of electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, it comes after visible region before that there will be ultraviolet and uh, vacuum ultraviolet x-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays and things like that. So, please look at the slide now. So, we are entering into module 4 instrumentation and applications of infrared spectroscopy. Okay. Now, in contrast to ultraviolet spectroscopy which I have explained to you so far, the infrared spectrum provides a rich array of absorption bands which can provide a wealth of structural information about a molecule. Now, you can imagine uh, if I uh, if you remember what I have taught you earlier you would always feel uh, you would always know that uh, the ultraviolet and visible spectrum of a compound gives you hardly 2 or 3 peaks uh, in the ultraviolet range and maybe 1 or 2 peaks in the visible range. Okay. So, the maximum you can see could be about 3 or 4 peaks corresponding to different electronic energy levels only in UV visible range that is 4, uh, 400 to 750 or uh, 800, 900 up to the that is visible uh, 180 to 350 is the 350 to 400 is the ultraviolet range. So, in the ultraviolet range I will get about uh, 2 or 3 peaks and in the visible region if it is colored if you can see the color perce perceive the color of a substance with your naked eye then you will be able to see one or two peaks not more than that. Compared to that infrared spectrum will show you at least about 10 to 20 peaks maybe more. So, the every peak can provide you information about the compound a functional group or a presence of an element something like that. So, uh, the wealth of its structural information about the molecule that is obtained is gives us a method for studying materials in all physical states that is I can take the infrared spectrum of a gaseous compound, I can take the infrared spectrum of a liquid and also I can take the infrared spectrum of a solid. Now, imagine if a substance is present in all the three forms I can get different 
uh, spectra differing only slightly for a for the same compound in solid form in liquid form and in the gaseous form. So, again additional information can be obtained if I have to take the spectrum of infrared spectrum of a compound. So, whether it is a gas or liquid or solid there are spe infrared spectrometers available which will be useful for the recording of an infrared spectrum and uh, analytically useful infrared spectrum range covers the following. So, what are those ranges? I have written here one is more near infrared ok. In the near infrared I have uh, starting point is 15000 centimeters inverse to 3000 centimeters inverse. This range of radi electromagnetic radiation is known as near infrared region ok. So, near infrared region quite often uh, quite often is available along with UV visible spectrophotometers. It is not part of regular routine organic chemist uh, equipment where he uses um, all infrared regions. No, it is not. So, infra near infrared region is one part which is normally associated with a spectrophotometer that is UV visible and near IR all three combined in one such spectrophotometers are available in the market and they are quite useful in characterizing a substance. If they can be used for solid or liquid or gaseous either way which I have already explained. Now, let us go back to this uh, infrared spectrum range. Uh, in this slide I have also given you the data in terms of micrometers actually this is micrometers we will correct this. So, uh, it is not millimeter it is micrometer. So, 0 0.672 3 3.33 micrometers is uh, the range for near infrared and in the mid infrared range we have 4002 it starts from 4000 centimeters inverse to 400 centimeters inverse ok. So, these are this is the area where lot of organic chemists use it and then uh, corresponding range in micrometer is 2.5 to 25 micrometers ok. Now, there is another part of infrared that is known as far IR that is 200 centimeters to 10 centimeters inverse. Here it ends around 400 quite often normal infrared spectrum spectrometers go up to 200 centimeters also, but from 200 to 10 centimeters if you want to cover infra, um, infrared region then you should go for a far IR equipment. Now, 50 micrometers to, uh, to 1000 micrometer is the range for far IR. So, among these the most used by all organic chemists is 4000 to 670 centimeters inverse, but you cannot say it is uh, just 670 centimeters inverse whatever instrument you have bought for your uh, laboratory it may be 400 it may be 200 uh, like that uh, centimeters inverse and the most used one is the range. So, uh, what I want you to appreciate is this 4000 to 3000 etcetera it need not worry you because normally mid IR infra instruments range from 4000 to 400 or 200. Near infrared regions may start from 15000 centimeters inverse to 4000 or 3000 it does not matter whether 1000 centimeter this side or that side you do not have to go to another IR if you want to cover 4000 here that may not be necessary same thing is true with respect to far IR ok. So, these are the ranges and people use P 
people use the both centimeters inverse to describe the availability of a peak or micrometers both of them are in continuous use depending upon the uh, organic chemists preference. Some people are very good at remembering infrared spectrum at centimeters inverse some people are very good at uh, interpreting them in micrometers both are quite useful and one can choose what uh, one feels comfortable with. So, the microns or micrometers uh, were extensively used as the units of wavelength earlier, but nowadays wave numbers that is centimeters inverse are the accepted units. So, in most of the research papers uh, you will be seeing the um, infrared spectrum of the such and such a compound or a drug synthesized showed peaks at 4000 centimeters inverse, 1670 centimeters inverse, 4 uh, 625 centimeters inverse like that different peaks can be described in the uh, literature. So, internationally accepted are centimeters inverse, but it depends upon the personal use. So, a simple reciprocal relationship exists between wavelength and wave number this I have already taught to you when I was teaching you about the electromagnetic radiation. So, uh, the wave number is nothing but uh, 10,000 divided by lambda you can look at this slide I have put it in the data for your convenience. So, a simple reciprocal relationship exists between wavelength and wave number that is a wave number is denoted by a frequency that is mu centimeters inverse that is nothing but 10,000 divided by lambda this lambda should be in micrometers. Okay. So, the wave number is directly proportional to the absorbed energy that is k is equal to e, is e by h c whereas, wavelength is inversely proportional to the absorbed energy this I need not uh, you know emphasize again and again. But suffice it to say that you can use wave number or wavelength both. Okay. So, if it is wavelength uh, if it is wave number you use uh, centimeters inverse and if it is uh, the wavelength then you go for micrometers. Okay. Now, the information contained in the infrared spectrum generally originates from the molecular vibrations. This I had uh, explained to you earlier most of the IR spectrum are vibrational transitions occurring in the structure of a molecule when bombarded with electromagnetic radiation that is infrared. Okay. What is the infrared range? Range is from 4000 to 200 and then 15000 to 3000 or 4000 or 25 micrometers to 10 micrometers. You can uh, choose either of them any of them, but there are dedicated instruments separate dedicated instruments for uh, near IR there is one instrument that is normally comes with spectrophotometer U visible near IR. And, uh, normal infrared starts from 4000 to 200 that is normal IR and another instrument is available which is much more costlier than the normal infrared that is 10 uh, 25 microns to 10 microns. See you can observe that uh, I am saying so much centimeters inverse in the near IR and centimeters inverse in the mid IR. And micrometers in the far IR because it is 25 to 10 easy to remember. So, the functional uh, fundamental modes that are associated with the vibrations of specific functional groups that is what makes the infrared spectrometry a very special tool for us to identify a compound or follow a reaction. So, 
the functional groups like an acid group COOH attached to an organic moiety or OH group alcoholic group attached to an organic moiety ethyl alcohol, methyl alcohol, butyl alcohol all alcohols will have only OH group attached to an organic moiety. Then aldehydes methyl aldehyde formaldehyde, formaldehyde, estaldehyde, propanaldehyde etcetera another class of compounds ketones like that amines, amines and many other compounds they are all having specific functional groups and the changes occurring in the molecular orbitals of these functional groups in the vibrational range are uh, of these specific functional groups can give rise to number of peaks. So, the total molecule infrared spectrum is a fairly complex uh, uh, structure or uh, uh, spectrum you will see. So, sometimes you will see vibrational overtones that means, another peak at double the wavelength, but it has uh, it refers to the same functional group. So, they are known as overtones or summational modes. So, the summational modes or vibrational mo uh, overtones are available for fundamental vibrations, it, they are not available for every transition now and uh, sometimes they of occur in the same uh, region of mid IR or far IR or something like that. Sometimes if, if you are working in mid IR the overtone may occur in far IR also. So, at that time you will not be able to see the overtone um, um, or summational mode of the fu fundamental vibration. So, IR analysis simply involves the characterization of a material with respect to the presence or absence of a specific group of compounds frequency associated with one or two fundamental modes of vibration or by a complex. So, we need something like a pattern recognition. So, uh, what do we mean by pattern recognition? It is pattern recognition can is to recognize a pattern if I know a compound uh, if I prepare a pure compound I can I can record the spectrum of the compound and try to remember this general structure of the IR peaks all peaks. So, the next time I see a similar uh, IR spectrum I will say yes this is ethyl alcohol spectrum something like that. So, that is pattern recognition, but pattern recognition can happen in uh, different uh, modes. For example, a guy who is a man who is um, very good at pattern recognition um, in a particular component may not be good at the pattern recognition of some other compounds or a person may be good in uh, pattern recognition than uh, other persons. So, pattern recognition itself is a separate science where the computer algorithms are used to recognize particular patterns and say this is the compound. So, pattern recognition by a computer search and match algorithm of an unknown compound can be compared to an existing compound. So, using a reference database, reference databases of several infrared spectrometers, spec uh, several infrared spectrum of thousands of compounds are available in databases. So, all you got to do is put them in the computer uh, uh, in the instrument itself and simply take the spectrum and ask it to do the apply the uh, algorithm to find out which compound uh, the spectrum refers to. So, that is uh, high end spectrophotometer that is uh, infrared. So, the spectral data is also used to measure one or more compounds in a simple or complex mixture also. So, what we are saying essentially in this slide is the information available in infrared spectrum 
is complex, it can be give us uh, they are all associated funda with fundamental modes of the functional groups like aldehyde, acid, aldehyde, alcohol and then uh, acids, carboxylic acids, amines etcetera and all these analysis can be um, identified to, or traced to the original compound by human eye uh, informa information process by the human eye looking at the complex spectrum or by the computer quite often we may not be interested in the whole compound as such, but we are interested in a particular functional group. So, the functional group also if I remember the wavelength I will be looking only at that wavelength whether a peak is there or not to just for pass fail test for uh, such things. So, the spectral data can be used to measure one or more compounds in a given mixture also. So, that is that becomes a little tricky especially if you want to do the unknown analysis ok. So, a non-linear molecule containing n atoms has 3 n minus 6 possible vibrational modes through which infrared radiation may be absorbed. So, you can imagine how many atoms are there in a in methane C H 4 one is carbon 4 hydrogen atoms. So, uh, look at the slide now uh, what I am saying is the there are n atoms in a given molecule and it has vibrational modes of 3 n minus 6. So, for 4 elements ok n for 4 atoms C H 4 5 atoms for 5 atoms like methane C H 4 I have 3 n minus 6 that is 3 to 5 um, minus 6 that is 9. So, simple compound like a methane has 9 peaks 9 absorption vibrational modes and imagine the same for benzene C 6 H 6 is the formula for benzene and that makes it 12. So, 12 into 3 that is 36 minus 6 that is 30. So, 30 possible fundamental absorption bands can occur uh, in benzene. So, it is almost humanly impossible to remember all the 30 possible fundamental vibrations and their wavelengths etcetera. So, in order that a particular vibration it does not mean that all the vibra each vibrational mode gives rise to a uh, infrared uh, peak. No, there are certain vibrational peak uh, levels bands which are banned some are forbidden. So, only a few vibrational modes appear in infrared spectrum, but they are much more than UV visible. So, that is what it means essentially we are looking at far more number of peaks compared to UV visible uh, near infrared, but every vibrational mode does not lead to an IR peak some are forbidden. So, and every molecule does not give rise to IR peak uh, in order that a particular vibration results in a specific absorption band the vibration must cause a change in the dipole moment of the molecule. This is a very important aspect we all ask this question in interviews. So, what kind the question is what kind of molecule gives rise to infrared spectrum the answer we expect is the only those compounds where there is a dipole moment change in the dipole moment occurs in a given molecule that compound can give rise to infrared spectrum all others are not. 
that means a symmetrical molecule cannot give rise to infrared spectrum. So, the molecules containing certain symmetry groups are automatically excluded right. So, now from the uh, infrared or even if they give you some spectrum they are all very simplified spectra. So, the um, if I have carbon carbon double bond in ethylene. So, what is the formula for ethylene? It is CH2 CH2. You can imagine that it is a fairly symmetrical molecule. Okay. So, uh, there are two carbon atoms, two hydrogen atoms uh, like this uh, in between a carbon atom and there is no change in the dipole moment. So, a compound like ethylene may not give you an absorption spectrum in IR or carbon stretching CH stretching carbon hydrogen stretching of the methane may not result in an absorption band because there is one carbon one hydrogen there is no change in the dipole moment. So, uh, if absorption occurs outside the IR region or too close for resolution or if it is too weak to appear as a distinct peak again I do not see any IR spectrum. So, the observed number of actual absorption bands will be less than the predicted number always, but they are much more we will continue our discussion on the infrared spectrum in the next uh, session.